and two meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, we are light two members at the moment, Catherine Miller and Michael Tranfaglia. Uh, we are expecting uh, Ms. Miller to come in sometime in the next few minutes. We haven't, uh, we're not quite sure about Mr. Tranfaglia, but we have a quorum. So we will proceed with business. Um, the first item on the agenda, as written, is to approve the minutes of the November 27, 2002 meeting. We haven't had a meeting since November 27, so these are aging a bit. Hopefully everybody's had an opportunity to, to review them. Our recording secretary is not here tonight, but we understand that she is watching at home in TV land. So hello out there, Barbara. She will hopefully take notes for us for our minutes um, via TV. Any comments on the minutes from November 27, 2001? I have no substantive uh, corrections to make, only two very minor, almost two minor to justify mentioning them, but I will. Um, on line seven, the minutes refer uh, to me as president of the board. The board does not have a, a president, um, so I'd request that the minutes be changed to reflect uh, that title as chair as opposed to president. And on page two, line 34, um, almost in the category of a typo, it says by its definition and its apostrophe S, there should be no apostrophe, it should just be ITS. And other than that, I have no suggestions for changes. So hearing no other suggestions, could I have a motion for approval uh, of the minutes and so move. Second. Uh, uh, motion by Mr. Keneally, second by Mr. LaPlante. All those in favor? And we will have one abstention from our new member. <laughs> and it, um, the minutes are approved by a vote of four in favor, um, none opposed with one abstention, which brings me to the first item of business that I should have raised, and that is to welcome our new board member, and Penny, um, pardon me for not having done that at first, because I should have. Uh, we welcome uh, Penny uh, Jordan Barthelman as our new board member, um, just appointed as of January 1. But since we didn't have a meeting in January or in February, this is her first meeting, so welcome. The next item of business I would like to take up out of order before we move to um, old business, I would like to move to what is listed on the agenda under paragraph E, other business, and that is the annual election of the chair and secretary um, under the uh, rules and regulations of the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, section 1B1, the board is required um, annually at its January meeting to um, elect a chair and secretary for the year. And again, since this is our first meeting of the year, um, it's probably something that we should take up first. So if there are no objections to us taking that up out of order, um, I would like to do that. Um, and we'll pause for one moment to let other board, one more board member join us and coming into camera view momentarily. Mr. Tranfaglio, welcome. Uh, Mr. Chair, you might want to suggest um, or at least tell the audience that, that the Mary Page application, we had sent out uh, notice notices and then she withdrew before we even got them in your packet. So if there's anybody from that area that's here for that case, they might not want to stay if 
because it's not on the agenda. Okay. Um, I didn't know that any notices had been sent out. Um, what Mr. Smith was saying is that if, if anybody is here for the Mary Page application, uh, that has been withdrawn. So if you came for that, you're certainly welcome to stay for all the other exciting things that will come up this evening. But if you'd rather go home and watch from the comfort of your couch, you're welcome to do that. Um, Usually we do. I didn't. I don't have any. Bruce, do we have copies of the agenda? We'll make some copies if you'd like. We can certainly tell you what is on the agenda uh, if you want to know the order. Is that what you're interested in? Um, the first item on our agenda under old business was to hear an administrative appeal uh, by the Chinquette family LLC. That has been withdrawn. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, a request from Marianne and John Doherty, 30 Hunts Point Road. Uh, next item on the agenda is an appeal of Andrew and Susan, is it Dubuque, uh, 586 Preble Street. After that is uh, to hear the appeal of Stephen and Lauren LaPlante, 1176 Sawyer Road. And next, the request of Michael Boucher, or Boucher, which is it? Boucher, Boucher uh, representing Christopher and Laura Lynch, 880 Shore Road. And that is the agenda. Um, anyway, unless, if there are no objections, I would like to take up out of order the election of the chair and secretary. Um, so hearing no objections, we'll take up uh, that item of business. I would like to have the pleasure of nominating David Backer to be chair for the coming year. I'd like to second that. <coughs> Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Um, all those in favor? I will abstain. Um, the motion is approved by a vote of five in favor, uh, zero opposed. Um, and I thank you all and assure, assure you that I will continue to do my best to justify the board's confidence. Um, a motion for the election of secretary for the upcoming year. I make a motion um, for Jack Keneally to be the secretary for the upcoming year. Second. A second. Um, would you like to go by uh, Ms. Jordan Barthelman or Ms. Barthelman or Ms. Jordan? Uh, or Penny? Actually, Penny. Well, yeah. would you use Ms. Barthelman or? It would be Jordan. Jordan, okay. Second, Ms. Jordan. Um, all those in favor of the motion? Opposed? One abstention. The motion is approved by a vote of five in favor, zero opposed. Back to the order of the agenda. Um, item C, old business. The administrative appeal of Chinquette Family LLC has been withdrawn. So uh, that will take us to the next item on the agenda, and that is to hear a request from Mary Ann and John Doherty. 30 Hunts Point Road, tax map U38, lot 1-32 for an accessory dwelling unit. Are Marianne and John Doherty here? Would you please uh, tell us your name and address, please? John Doherty, 30 Hunts Point Road. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Bruce for the help. I think I spent more time with him on this than he probably did with, did, did with people on a 40 house development. Anyway, what, we, um, what we'd like to do is um, have um, my wife's aunt, um, who's uh, 87 years old and lives in California, we'd like her to come and stay with us and take care of us in our old age. Um, no, seriously, uh, we, she'd like to, we'd like to have her come and stay with us in our house, and uh, it would be um, would be in the basement, um, small little apartment. Um, be no changes to the outside of the dwelling that we do. There's a full bath already in the basement, in the in the in the um, 
and what we're what we'd like is to put a, a small little stove and refrigerator unit in a in, the, in there with her so that she can be semi-independent um, and when we initially uh, so it, the way the final plans have come up is we're just talking about uh, the total uh, total square footage of her her place would be 460 square feet of, uh, of the uh, of the uh, basement unit. And I think there's some pictures in your packet um, of what that would entail. Um, I don't know whether how much more you'd like me to add, or if you happen to answer any questions you have. Is there any um, independent egress from that space? I'm, I'm sorry? Independent egress. You mean a, a, a way out? Right. Yes, there is. There's a separate, there's a separate entrance. And uh, it's a walkout basement, um, fully lighted. It's a very high. I think there's pictures in there of um, me standing at the, at the basement window. So it's, it's a very, uh, very easily accessible. OK. So it's on the, 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 the doorway on the back side of the house? Then? Right. And we're also planning a lift in the, in the house, too, oh. if, if, if we need it. I'll probably end up needing it before she will. I just wanted to make sure that I understood the answer. There is a door? Yes, there is. Doorway? Yes. <clears throat> Is anyone else here tonight to speak in favor of or in opposition to this matter? Are you here to speak in favor or opposed? I'm here to just find out about it. I'll speak in favor and vote or whatever. OK. okay. Um, Is there a specific questions that he would have that I can answer? Or? Um, well, maybe. Well, maybe. <laughs> and we'll give you an opportunity to respond to any that that he might raise. Um, any other questions for Mr. Doherty? Okay, thank you, Mr. Doherty. Thank you. Um, anyone else wish to speak in favor of this? Um, well, why don't you come up okay. to the podium, if you would, please, okay. and tell us your name and address. Bob Packer, 21 Hunts Point Road. Well, let's wait till you get to the podium so we okay. pick up your voice. Okay. I'm Bob Packer, and I'm at 21 Hunts Point Road. And I think the Dohertys are doing the very proper thing for an in-law. And I think the, um, the situation with an in-law apartment or whatever you might call it, I think it's a very worthwhile thing. The only thing I'm concerned about is when the Dohertys, you know, when Grandma goes to, you know where she's going to go someday. Same place we're all going to go. Right. Can we have an apartment there? That's my only concern. How are we going to control this thing? You know, if, um, you know, my, my in-laws are both passed away, but, you know, had uh, the time come that I needed to do the same thing with my home, I would have, you know, liked to have done it. But the thing that concerns me down at Cable is this where I live, on Hunts Point Road, there are a lot of young people with big mortgages, big houses, and this might be a way to subsidize their living if they got something like this. I know that's not a fact, at least one. But uh, I think we should some way control it and look at it you know for the future we don't want a bunch of apartments down there and uh, that's the only i have no i have no objection to them doing this the way they're doing it but what's going to happen later on so there are my uh, i'm positive about that but my concerns you've uh, you've heard okay. okay thank you thank you now this is I, i'd like to respond to that because this is actually something that I had raised last time we had one of these before us on Two Lights Road. Um, not many meetings ago, we had a similar request uh, for an accessory dwelling unit. And I asked the same question that Mr. Packer just asked. And that was, what happens when a new family moves in? Do they have to come in and reestablish the elements required? Or does the granting of an accessory dwelling unit 
run with the property so that anybody new who comes in there can use it under those same conditions. And the answer at the time was once it's granted, it's granted for that property. Um, That's my interpretation of the ordinance because it, unlike other ordinances that speak specifically about in-law apartments, and we call it an accessory dwelling unit because it carries a little bit further, um, it doesn't, it doesn't specifically state that it, will, it, will, it, it doesn't run with the land. It doesn't make a stipulation that, right. like all our ordinances, will come right out and say, if the situation changes, it shall revert back to its former single family dwelling. That but, doesn't say that here. Right. I, I, I agree. It doesn't say that. But to answer part of your concern, Mr. Packer, the ordinance does require that it be occupied by one or two people who have a close personal relationship with the residents of the main dwelling. Now, last time this came up, I also questioned what that meant. Um, and the answer is I, that I recall that I got from our code enforcement officer was if I go out there and the people have their arms around each other, I consider it a close personal relationship. <laughs> am, I, am I misquoting you, Bruce? No, you're not. Um, um, for the, um, so if somebody, you, you can't simply rent your accessory dwelling unit, can't put an ad in the paper um, and find a tenant to provide income. It has to be a close personal relationship, whatever that means. That doesn't mean it has to be a blood relative. It doesn't have to be an aunt. It doesn't have to be a brother. Um, it could be a friend, same gender, other gender. Um, the ordinance is not specific at all on that point. It simply says a close personal relationship with the residents, whatever that means. Um, in the case of the, la the last case we had on this, close personal relationship is one that actually began as a tenant. And the person had been a tenant for years from the parents, I believe. Right. And over the years, they became a close personal, they became a close personal relationship. So it's a little unusual. Um, there is your me. question is a good one. But you see where I'm coming Yes, I do. But I, the answer to the question, as, as I understand it, at least in the one time that I've seen it applied in the time that I've been on the board, that was the way we interpreted it. At least that was the answer I got. Now, that hasn't been tested. And, and it isn't, it isn't, that wasn't a random interpretation. I did do some research and talk to the town planner and talk to the people that developed this section. And their intent was to allow somebody that's not necessarily a relative, but that, that is a close friend, to be able to live there. Um, the intent was not to limit it to in-laws. There are a few safeguards, or at least one good safeguard, uh, when, when properties are listed, the realtors usually check to see what, what the status of that unit would be, and that's when I tell them exactly what the approval was granted for so that, that nobody's misled. So they can't vote there and advertise it as a two-family. They can only advertise it as an accessory dwelling unit to the main unit as the purpose of the audience states. So they can't false advertise, and they do usually ask the questions. Uh, most realtors today are very conscientious and as far as not wanting to get sued. So there, are, there is that safeguard. One question, Mr. Chairman. It, what, what, could you come up to the podium again so we pick up your question? for everybody who's not here in the room? You know, in, you, know, in, you know, for everyone's protection, what can we do in the future? Uh, how do we change an ordinance? Uh, what do we seek to, to really control this thing? Like Bruce told me on the phone, he said, I can't look in windows, and I, I understand that. But, you know, this thing can get out of control, and, and down there where I'm talking about, I don't want it to happen, you know, they've got to, wonderful situation going and I, I, I believe it but you know they might um, go away someday and then I've got some college kids from USM with the cars in the driveway renting apartments so that's what I look for. So what can we do? Well the process for amending the ordinance uh, start any any amendment to the ordinance uh, to the zoning ordinance has to go through the planning board is that right? Yeah. It originates with the planning board. Yes. 
Um, I mean, there is, there is a process. Well, actually, the planning board or the town council. Um, for recommending uh, amendments to the ordinance, and it's a work in progress. So it's, it's, not, as if, it's not as if there's never uh, a time that's inappropriate to propose an amendment. And this won't be the first time that we've encountered a provision in the ordinance that is not quite as clear as, as we all would like, but this is a good example of one. You, you, you still would, even if you tighten it up to say that it had to come back for approval, when that change come, takes place with somebody moving out or, or somebody passing on, it happens in every town. That, that's there, there's dollar signs in people's eyes, and, and it happens, no matter what you write in the book. So an enforcement action when would be give, taken against somebody, whether it be an in-law apartment that needed another reapproval, or whether it be somebody that moved out and was written it. I mean, it, the issue would still be there and would have to be addressed, and it's only addressed through usually policing the neighbors. Um, so, I mean, that's when, when it becomes an issue. So I think we still have that, you have that right to come to me and say, look, I think somebody's living in there that isn't a close personal relationship, and I think they're renting it, and then I'd have to address it even, and this ordinance would, would cover the same situation, so. And, and I, I probably should, didn't think about it, until Mr. Packer came up here to speak, um, should disclose, although I don't, cons I don't disclose this is what I perceive to be a conflict, but I should dis disclose it anyway. I did receive a notice of um, this application uh, because I live in the neighborhood. Um, I live off Channel View on uh, Ragosa Way. In fact, um, my um, land adjoins Mr. Packer's. Um, I'm a street and a half away, sort of, from the Doherty's, but apparently still within physical distance to have received the notice. So I should make that disclosure to you that I did receive it. Um, anyone else who wishes to speak in favor of or in opposition to the um, application uh, of Marianne and John Doherty? Well, we will close the public comment uh, portion of the hearing and open it for board discussion. Discussion from the board? <coughs> Comments or any further questions for uh, the Doherty's? One of the items I had noted in um, the application was the number of current parking spaces. The ordinance calls for one parking space shall be provided for the accessory dwelling unit. And in the application, it does not increase the number of spaces. However, he already has four. I'm not certain if would an additional space need to be created above and beyond what he presently has? Is there a minimum, I guess, would be the question. Well, I'd have to look up. I don't have to normally look for at requirements for parking for residential dwelling, but normally two, two parking places is customary. So anything above and beyond that would, would probably meet the intent. So at four, he would meet that criteria without the I would, need yes, to create an additional yes, space. Would. And also, number of current bedrooms is four, and then number of proposed bedrooms is one, so I'm assuming that's a total increase up to five bedrooms. creating. <clears throat> I, I would read it that way also. Mr. Doherty is, is confirming that, yes. Was. She'll go on to five mm -hmm. and four. Five yeah, that may be an issue. Uh, is, is that an issue for the, uh, well, we're on public sewer. We're on public sewer now. Okay, that's not an issue. Okay. <laughs> I pulled the I pulled the file and there was a septic system design that was put in in not in '86, so I was assuming you were still on that, but I guess we did talk about that. So that's not an issue. Good. Okay. And one last question: in the packet we received for the application that we received for the February meeting, it contained the drawing 
uh, where a bedroom, which is a 10 by 11, was listed. And in the last packet that we received, there was an attachment and added a page for the application where that 10 by 11 bedroom has been removed. What, is there an explanation for that being removed from that living space? Uh, the applicant was in excess of 600 square feet dedicated, so. Uh, the only question I had in going through the elements is that the first element on uh, page 138 of the ordinance requires that the applicant uh, establish the lot area by a survey signed and sealed by a registered main surveyor. Uh, we do have in the packet a copy of what appears to be a portion of a survey. Does that, that suffice? Is a, that is a survey, yes. I do, excuse me, I do have a sense that I do have a right poster. The same one that's in the packet, only yeah. full size, yeah. Yes. Is that the survey that what we have in the packet was copied from? I believe it is. Okay, have, have you seen that, Bruce? I have not. Well, you might, Mr. Doherty, just bring it up and show it to our code enforcement officer for him to confirm that we've met the element number one, and that is that we have a survey signed and sealed by a registered main surveyor. Yeah, it's the same one we have here. I'll make a record of this date. Um, Eighteen two thousand one. Hearing no other, other discussion, let's go through the elements um, and the findings. We have actually two sets of findings to make here. Um, first will be the findings under section 19-7-5 for the creation of an accessory dwelling unit. Um, paragraph B, requirements, and there are um, eight of them. Um, let's just go through those uh, individually uh, with a show of hands. All those who find that the criteria of element number one on page 138 has been met, um, lot minimum 12,000 square feet um, as established by a survey signed and sealed by a main surveyor, demonstrate compliance with town sewage ordinance. Ms. Miller, are you abstaining I since am. you came in midway? Okay. Uh, we'll show that element number one has been met, um, satisfied by a vote of six in favor, um, zero opposed, one abstention. Ms. Miller, um, all those who find that element number two has been satisfied, um, total existing floor area, excluding garage of at least 1,500 square feet before the addition of the accessory dwelling unit find that that has been satisfied by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Ms. Miller abstaining. Um, next, that element number three has been satisfied, no more than 25% of the resulting floor area um, will be occupied by the accessory dwelling unit um, and not less than 300 square feet nor more than 600 square feet. Um, and that there is an interior connecting doorway between the dwelling and the accessory dwelling unit. Um, that's found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed, with Ms. Miller abstaining. Uh, next, all those who find that element number four has been satisfied. Um, the addition to the floor area shall not exceed 
15% of the floor area of the structure of the single family dwelling prior to conversion. Um, all those in favor? Uh, that's found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Ms. Miller abstaining. Um, number five, all those who find that that has been satisfied, one parking space shall be provided. Uh, we actually have four parking spaces, but all those who find that that has been satisfied, um, that's found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Um, any exterior, all those who find that item number six has been satisfied, um, any exterior alteration preserving the single family appearance. There actually are no exterior appearances, exterior alterations being made. Um, but for the findings, um, all those who find that that has been satisfied, um, that is found in the affirmative. Six in favor, zero opposed. Ms. Miller abstaining. Um, all those who find that element number seven has been satisfied. Um, and that is that the use will not include a home occupation or home business. Um, all those who find that that has been satisfied. Six in favor, zero opposed. Ms. Miller abstaining. And last, all those who find that element number eight has been satisfied, um, that the accessory dwelling unit and the dwelling itself um, are held in the same ownership. Um, and that has been shown. All those uh, who find in favor, six in favor, zero opposed. Uh, Ms. Miller abstaining. And that takes us to the second set of um, conditions to be met. And that is under uh, the conditional use permits, section 19-5-5 on page 54 of the ordinance. Um, Are there any conditions that any board members feel are necessary or appropriate to impose on the approval of the application? Um, hearing none, we'll go on to the next item, and that is um, a finding that the, the proposed use will not create hazardous traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Um, all those who find that uh, that condition has been satisfied. And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Ms. Miller abstaining. Um, all those who find that the proposed use will not create unsanitary conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air, or other aspects of its design or operation. And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Ms. Miller abstaining. Uh, next, all those who find that the proposed use will not adversely affect the value of adjacent properties. And that is found in the affirmative, six in favor, zero opposed. Ms. Miller abstaining. Uh, next, the proposed site plan and layout are compatible with adjacent property uses and with the comprehensive plan. And that's found in favor of zero, six in favor, zero opposed. Ms. Miller abstaining. And last, uh, that the design and exterior appearance of any proposed building will, will constitute an attractive and compatible addition to its neighborhood, although it need not have a similar design, appearance, or architecture. And again, we're not changing the exterior appearance at all, correct? Um, so all those who find that in the affirmative. And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor. <coughs> Uh, zero opposed. Ms. Miller abstaining once again. And all those conditions having been found in the affirmative, we need a motion overall to approve the application. Would anyone like to make that motion? <coughs> I will. Mr. Trampaglia? It's a matter of uh, Mary Ann and John Doherty's uh, conditional use application for the property located at 30 Hunts Point Road 
specifically seeking a conditional use permit for 600 square feet as an accessory dwelling unit to be located in the daylight basement of the existing dwelling be approved. Right here is approved. Second. I'll second it. Second, Ms. Jordan. Discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Opposed? The application is approved by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Ms. Miller abstaining. Next item on our agenda is to hear the appeal of Andrew and Susan Dubuque, 586 Preble Street, tax map U02, lot one, for a front line, front property line on Ottawa Street, variance of 10 feet from the required 20 feet to construct a two-story addition to the existing dwelling. Are you Mr. Dubuque? Yes, I am. Do we have other people here in the audience to speak either in favor of or in opposition to this application? Okay. Um, would you, well, give us your name and address, please. My name is Andrew Dubuque, 586 Preble Street. The floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> 586 Preble Street is right behind the cookie jar. If you need a point to place it. Um, we've lived there for 16 years. I'm a teacher and my wife is a part-time consultant and we have two children living there also. We're looking to build a garage. The garage would serve two purposes. One to house a car and the second one just to give us some extra storage space for ladders and tools and the such. We also would like to uh, have a room over that. Uh, we have a small house and it was great when we had a one-year-old infant. It doesn't work quite as well now with two teenagers and uh, so we're hoping to save money uh, to do them both at the same time. If you look through our program here, I would just like to go through very quickly that uh, <coughs> we're asking for a one car garage, for, uh, approximately 14.6 by 24 feet. And uh, we were uh, originally hoping for a two car garage, um, but when the measurements came in from the surveyor, uh, we uh, lost some ground that we didn't, that uh, we thought we had that we didn't. So we had to uh, reassess and go from two car garage to a one car garage. And uh, the problem with all this is the shape of our lot. We have a very small lot. Uh, it has uh, two frontages. We're on Preble Street and we're also on Ottawa. Um, the town recognizes Ottawa as a front street. Uh, so uh, we are uh, kind of trapped in by by the, uh, the, uh, the dimensions of the lot. Well, there's absolutely no other place to build on our lot, if you could see our plan. Uh, <clears throat> if we build on any side, we'd need a variance. Uh, it makes best sense to build uh, right where it is. There's a concrete pad now there. That, that's where the driveway is right now. Uh, it would gain us access right into our kitchen. Um, so all things point to placing it right there. Uh, it would not alter any views of the neighborhood, pose any fire hazards, or reduce any privacy. And um, if we look at, uh, it also would not change any of the shrubbery or trees there. Uh, basically what it's replacing is a concrete pad. Um, so they would dig that up, put down a, um, a wall and, and build from there. Um, we sent some 
extra items in there, and I do want to make one change. I'm sorry about this, but when I was doing some last minute lookovers, I realized that we transposed one figure wrong. It's on the Ottawa Street um, distance of houses to the street. Ours right now is 41, not 44. And uh, so the next one, the proposed, we just subtracted from the 44, so that's wrong too, so that should be 26. So 41 feet current and 26 feet proposed. And we just put that in there to show that it would not change the, uh, the idea of the street. Uh, if you go down Ottawa Street, you'll see that the houses are, uh, many of them are close to the road. So uh, we are not altering the, the feel of the neighborhood. Uh, we also have in there a, uh, our mortgage certification drawing shown now where it says apron there is uh, the concrete pad that I talked about. The next one is our, uh, what we propose for our one car garage. And uh, we might be able to connect the second floors in with that little connection between, uh, with the house and the, and the one car garage to the second floor room. Now, Bruce said uh, that uh, with the variance, sometimes the mortgage certification drawing uh, may not be adequate, so uh, we went out and got uh, on the third page a survey done by uh, Ross Boundary Surveys, and uh, much to our chagrin, we lost. That's where we lost some land. <laughs> he came back with a more exact uh, measurement, and so that's when we went from a two-car to a one-car garage uh, with his with the survey. And then the final page on that is just a, uh, a sketch that my brother-in-law did of, of how it would look. Since then, uh, we have gotten some builders and I, I do have a copy of a uh, more specific plan. May I hand that out right now? Just the front or does it matter? Do you have um, sufficient copies for yes. each of the board members? Yes, okay. please. <clears throat> Also in the packet is a, uh, a map of the neighborhood, and uh, we color-coded it to show the, uh, again, the distribution of garages in the neighborhood, and it's the uh, one with the pink and yellow. The green is ours on the corner of Preble and Ottawa, and uh, the code reads that uh, the yellow are uh, are the, the pink are garages with rooms above them, like we, what we want to do, and the yellow are uh, ones that have garages with no rooms above them. So in our neighborhood, anything that's pink or yellow it would be anything that has a garage um, in our neighborhood. And then using that map, you can look at any of the houses you want um, to refer to them. We put the numbers on. And we put the uh, square footage of their of their property. So uh, again, we hope that you can grant our our variance here. Uh, we'd love to be able to use the space for a uh, one car garage. We, we now have three drivers. We might eventually have three cars, and that would also afford us to keep one off the street. Uh, it also gives us just all that much more room for storage, and then the room above would be a welcome addition to, to us all. Thank you. Questions from members of the board? Mr. Buick, I have a, a simple question. I think it's uh, on your application form itself. Do you have that in, in front of you? Under the setback, I think that the current and proposed setback for the Preble seat side have been reversed. 
unless I've read that incorrectly. Bruce, you may want to help me out here. <clears throat> from your from your mortgage survey, anyways, it looks like your current setbacks are 25 feet from Preble. From Preble, right? right? With the garage, it looks to me it would be down to 19. I think they're just on the wrong lines. Is all. I'm uh, Preble won't change. Preble won't change at all. No, we're right in the same line. Um, Preble is our is the main road. Um, I, I see what you're saying. The 19 there is where our mud hut is. Uh, the, the bump out on the, on the map is where the 19 is within the current. And um, so I guess that would stay 19 because we're not changing that. But our, the, the, the construction would be 25 feet away from Preble. I guess that's how we interpreted that. OK. OK. Thank you. The front porch is being unchanged. The roof lines going to be different. Well, right now it's um, it was an add-on to the house, and uh, it has a flat roof right now. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try to also change that to to fit the architecture and put that roof on so it matches. Um, and it's it's a little flimsy right now, so we're going to put down posts uh, to make it just uh, be more solid. So we're going to do some work on that too, but we're not changing the footprint of that. Could I get clarification. Yeah. From Preble to the front of the building is 25 feet, and that's not changing, right? Right. Not 19 feet. Right. And 19 is the is the bump out. Is the uh, is the is the mud hut area. I think is. 25 for the regular part of the house. That's existing, though, isn't it? Right. right. Yeah. That's the distance from Preble to the closest point of your house currently is 19 right. feet. Right. And that's not changing. That's not changing. The addition is going to be set back set six back feet from that. from that. Bruce, are the side setbacks not an issue if you're looking at this exhibit here, the one with the pink? They're not an issue, no. Uh, the, the side, well, the one at right angle, or at one parallel of Preble Street would be the side. Okay. How about the uh, opposite that's 15, side? That's 15 feet and, or 10 feet, and the, and the rear would be, oh, I'm sorry, that would be the rear. This side here, which abuts, that's, it'd that's, be actually a budding lot identified as 10 on this map. If you look at the corner, that's 14 feet on the far corner. So it's much more. Right. That's, that's a rear setback, which on the non-conformance is 40. I think it's 10. Is uh, 15 feet. Oh. So, it would, so then it would not no be. No issue. You, uh, I went down for a site visit. It's really sort of an interesting network of streets there. It's great, isn't it? It's a lovely yeah. neighborhood. Um, Ottawa Street, a.k.a. Crescent Ave. I mean, there is a Crescent Ave further down. I don't right. Know. Separate street sign is Crescent Ave, but the street next to you is identified as Ottawa Street, right? Right. They, they changed the name a while ago, but Crescent used to come all the way around. The now sign. they have Ottawa go. Changed it all to one Ottawa going straight down. Okay. Crescent picks up where it curves. Okay. Um, what is the traffic flow like in there? I was just trying to deduce that when I was down there, and I really couldn't in a short time. It's a dead-end street, so yeah. the cars down there are only coming from those houses yeah. on Ottawa. And the same with Crescent. It just comes right back again to, to uh, well, actually, a short road there. It's not trouble, but it's, you know, it's just a, a U. So it's basically used uh, by the neighbors. Have you spoken to your neighbors about the addition? Yes. We sent out a, when we had a, and I have a letter there also, when we wanted to measure the distances to their road, um, we asked them, we wrote a letter, and they all responded very positively and said, sure, come on over.
Now, you're, you're bringing the setback down to 10 feet um, from Ottawa Street, Ottawa Road. Uh, street or road, I forget. From the street side, this is... Road, how about that? Okay. Um, are there any other houses that have a 10 foot or smaller setback, a you know, front setback? If you look at this right here. Yeah, I see one, is that, that's a seventh up to 60, is that the only house that has a setback that's on the order of 10 feet or less? Well, our actually from the road, uh, our house is the top right there. Um, we're going to still be 26 feet from the road. But because of the property line, uh, the town owns a lot of that. Okay, that wasn't fully clear to me before. Okay. okay. So there's a, there's a right of way that extends onto the grasslands mm -hmm. substantially, I guess. Substantial, yes, that killed us. <laughs> <laughs> so if I was to stand there, it would look like you were 26 feet away from the road. Right. But in reality, it's 10 feet where the right. So the town owns 16 feet from the edge of the road to the edge of the right of way. Mm -hmm. The uh, Ross boundary said that area was a real mess to, to figure out uh, because there are no there are, are no notes from how it was done that whole area. So. He's had a hard time with any time he's had to do any houses there trying to figure out the actual boundary lines. Um, Bruce, does the town own 16 feet on either side of the road? The other side is South Portland. If you look at the, if you look at the drawer, and this is, appears that they own that distance, which scale of one inch equals 16 feet. So that's not going to help me much here, but. Hmm. It's probably 14, probably around 14 feet from the edge of the pavement to the property line. Scale. Is that usual in oh, Cape Elizabeth? Happens all the time. Yeah. That much? We could put a small building over there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not what you want to do. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Little kiosk. They may build a new fire station next to your house. <laughs> I have a question regarding your survey made in July. Was that a boundary survey or was that uh, just a mortgage survey? The, um, the original one made in 1986, I believe. Right. That was the mortgage survey. That's mortgage survey. Is this a second one? Is this also a... The second one we paid for just to find that line on uh, where our boundary is in relationship to Ottawa. Okay. Uh, so currently the nearest point of your house to the sideline, actual sideline of Ottawa is 26.6 feet. Right. And if you continue that closest point straight from that sideline to edge of pavement, you have an accurate measurement of that distance based on from a survey standpoint. I it's think, not uh, noted on this survey. And it um, well, I measured it as 16. Bruce just said 14. So it's well, I mean I don't have a 16 scale. It's less than an inch, and one inch equals 16 feet. So. It's seven eighths of an inch, whatever that is. Seven eighths. Of and this this is also feet. taken from a fax. So. Um. So did he, did the surveyor actually come out and and set up his instruments? Oh yes, to it this costs time? a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He, he came out. I wonder why he didn't include. He only has one measurement on this whole drawing, and and typically if 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 you or in a situation that you're in where you're attempting to construct uh, in a variant situation, he would put multiple uh, uh, 
distances to locate this within your property. He put no rear or right-hand side measurements, for example, and whatever. That was uh, probably my uh, my guidance towards him that I, I said uh, we our problem was uh, how close were we to our boundary line and give us the gives the closest we were because we we're trying to fit a garage in there. Um, so those those are my directions to him. Because because they were going right up against that 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 line and hugging it that close with a variance from this board to ten feet. I suggested they have something more accurate than the mortgage inspection plan because you don't have any room to maneuver there. And that's, that's when he got Ross to do that one line because that was the line that was most in contention. The other lines uh, aren't issues because there's enough cushion. Uh, even if he was off a couple, three feet, he'd still have enough cushion to make that work. So you, this is, this is the only measurement that was requested. Is that it? Is that? That's correct. That close point. Okay. Uh, do you have a, a, based on this measurement information or the most current survey? Do you have a, site plan of the location, of your proposed. Addition, with measurements that I did not find that where is that have you indicated the actual it would um, it would just go very close to that line at that corner where that 26.61 meets that line that's going to be our back left corner uh, to which point to the to this 26.61 point that's going to be the back left corner of our structure and that's the only point of contention everything else is falls away from there so that's why we had to. That is an existing point, though, correct? The 26.1, where there it goes, or 26.61, that goes to your existing structure. Yes. Now, to that, you're going to add another, uh, uh, an addition. Right. Okay. Do you show that measurements? I would like to see those measurements on your site plan is what it's the well I'm I hitting. have it on the other site plan and that just takes into account that we're inside that. That's why we had it done. Say again? There are no measurements. The measurement we got why we ended at fourteen feet wide or fourteen six is because that would that's as far as that's as wide as we could go and still have a little play. Uh, there are no measurements on your proposed addition. It's it's right here. I mean, I, I don't have it. Right where? Well, on the a copy, it says it's going to be fourteen point six, and so I just measured it out and, and placed it in on there where it says proposed addition, and that's that's the mathematics of it. That that's as wide as we could get it. What are the dimensions of the structure that you're adding? That we're going to build? Yes. It is 14.6 by 24. Okay. Was that included in the packet anywhere? Yep. Right on the first page of, uh, or the, the second page briefly explains scope of work to be done. Like to add a one car garage, 14.6 by 24. Right. So is the 14.6 is? We arrived at that number because of the measuring. That's what we could get and still get a rectangle to fit in that back corner. But it's actually 14 feet 6 inches. Right. 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 As right. opposed to 14.6. Right. And the 24 feet is from front to back? Right. That's the. That's the uh, depth of the house. And the proposed addition on the, the pink square on your mortgage survey. Right. It's it's not a perfectly square 14 feet by six 
inches by 24 feet. You mean in the back there? Yeah. Right. Um, the pink that it says proposed area is odd shape. Right. The odd shape is, um, I just added that, that has nothing to do with, no. that has no impact on uh, the boundaries at all. We're, we're plenty of room back there. And what I was doing there is just in case our builder decided that we need stairwell uh, outside of the garage, just it's already very narrow. Uh, to put a stairwell in there might prove silly. So I just added that little stairwell there just, just in case. What is going to be over the garage? Uh, oh, just a one room. Oh, like the living room? Yeah, room. like a family room. And it's accessible through the house? It's going to be uh, accessible. Uh, again, we're uh, playing with the finances on that, uh, either through the kitchen, which is where the X is, the 9 by 12, or um, in the back there, which is my wife's office, uh, where the uh, where it connects in the back. So that that besides the rectangle, that place to the right there will, will probably just be a, uh, a pseudo breezeway, where all the doors are going to meet, and you know. Um, but again, that may not even happen. Is the, exist, is the existing structure that's there now going to be coming down? No, nothing no. will be. Okay. Nothing's being removed. From Nothing's the being removed. Okay. okay. Mr. Dubuque, in following up on Dr. Chapman's question, if your 26.61 feet from the sideline of Ottawa Road now, and you're going to add something, a structure that is 14 and a half feet wide, 14 feet 6 inches. After the addition, you should be, if I'm doing the math right, and I'm sure our professor will check it for me, you'll be 12.11 feet from the sideline of Ottawa Road. Instead of 10, you mean? Instead of 10. Would you, would you? Wouldn't, wouldn't you if you're 26.61 feet now? But that's on a diagonal. Diagonal. Yeah, you know, but see, the <clears throat> building's going to. I'm a math teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well. I mean, stand out here, 26 The feet. diagonal won't remain the same after your addition is on? It will, but that 14 and a half feet put it in, it's going to be the same as 16 on a, on a diagonal. See, it's 14 and a half feet from here, so it's 23 and a half feet from here, even, even nine foot projection out here. So if you took a rectangle and squeezed it back until it fit, you're going to hit. You know, from this point. You're gonna, and because it's a, yeah, it brings it the boundary line to the diagonal. And you're right, there might be a couple, some play in there. I just put that down just to be safe. But it can't be any less than 10 feet. 14 right. and a half foot dimension is how far the new addition comes out from this point. It's actually coming out 23 and a half feet from this point. It's that back left corner that's giving us problems. Okay. Uh, back to this survey, I, 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 again, it, it, your site plan is uh, I think what what's confusing is you state it's a 14 by 24, yet looking at your and and the Looking at the site plan of your existing house, uh, there is a jog out on that corner. Right. Now, around that jog out, you're going to build an L-shaped addition. Is this correct? Uh, according to your paint cutout. The paint cutout saw. is is uh, the maximum we could do, and now it depends on finances what we're able to afford. Okay. Um, but I'm. Um, the dimensions is, is what's confusing. Uh, if it's 
six viewing it from the front but it's an additional whether that's a six or nine i assume that's a nine so it's a twenty three feet addition from the rear is that correct because you're looking at a jog out right I, I you're building your addition around an existing right jog out from the house and if we're going from the driveway uh, this is where i came up with those numbers it's a one car garage with a room over it uh, 14 across there 14 and a half on, on the front side on of the, the front house. side 24 deep back of our garage and the same with the room above it so the room and the garage would match those dimensions now we might use the piece to connect to the house there as just a way for all the stairs and doorways to meet kind of a breezeway slash mudroom kind of because there's going to be different heights coming from different things so we might use that spot as a, as a meeting place so you can come up from the basement in there and then up into the room or up into the, the original house now we may not even have that we may just go with that the with the behind the jog out area right you're saying could be a breezeway could, could be a right it's going to be kind of an unfinished place the the picket fence that's currently in that area where picket you, fences you perceive that is uh well the front of the picket fence would be um where the you mean the one parallel to preble street or parallel to ottawa yeah. i'll finish my question the picket fence that's currently running along the end of your house what is the distance of that picket fence from the existing corner that you show on this Ross survey? The picket fence that's parallel to Ottawa. Correct. Okay. Uh, the, the addition will be inside of that, inside okay. the picket fence. Do you know the distance along this 26.6 marked line on the survey? Where the picket fence is that so we can somehow put it right. in perspective i, I would uh, the, the if you got i don't know if you could see where the concrete pad is um with the that's the, we have a concrete pad uh, where basically that's what we're that's basically the dimensions and the picket fence along ottawa i would say at that corner is three feet closer to ottawa than what our addition would be. <clears throat> that picket fence would be closer than what we're building. Why is the pad there? Was there a structure there at one point in time? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. It was previous there. Um, rumor had it that uh, it was to store uh, boats. Okay. So it's a great basketball court. Your neighbor behind you on the lot you've indicated is number 10. Have you discussed this with them and received any feedback? From them? Uh, we have not discussed it face to face. They're, they're on and off. Um, it's, uh, it's Rick Churchill's old place. Sometimes his children are there, sometimes his wife's there. So, uh, But we did send them a message and they had no problems with us surveying and um, we did try um, a few years ago on the other side of our house to gain some space by uh, going out on the op opposite side and creating more space for our house that way. And she did come to that meeting and said she didn't want that. So and, and said what? She did not want that. Um, Mrs. Churchill did call today and ask questions. Was concerned that the basically the 
if, if something was going close, closer to her property line, and I told her it wasn't, it was going towards Ottawa, and she said, okay, thank you. And that was... You spoke with her to, yes. today. Those were her remarks last time. She said, why don't you do it on the other side? I won't have a problem with it. So. What is the suggested height of the peak of the roof on your addition? It's going to be, uh, again, this is all still being drawn up, but it's going to be below our peak now of our main house. So... Um, Do you know the height of that? I don't know the height of that. But it doesn't obstruct any sight lines because from Preble down, it would be your ruin the Churchills. You w wouldn't see the back of their house. It's the only view line I could see. Because it, it appears out of the rear of house number 10 that this would be a, a, a significant structure out the rear of their house is why I'm asking that question. House 10 is, uh, that's the Churchills. Uh, and that's well below our house. Um, so that's the back of their house. They're looking up and, you know, I'm not even sure what they could see from there. Um, I'm sure in the winter they might be able to see some sky, but. And there's a large oak tree in that corner. Will that right. be affected at all? No. Nope. Other questions from the board? Uh, hearing none, let's go through the elements of the <laughs> ordinance. Uh, first, um, there is nobody else to speak in favor of or opposed to the application. All those members of the board who find that there is no substantial departure from the, from the intent of the ordinance, and that is found in favor by a vote of seven in favor, uh, zero opposed. Um, all those who find that a literal, literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause a practical difficulty as defined by 30 Dash A, Main Revised Statutes, Annotated Section 4353-4C, which defines a practical difficulty as an occasion where the strict application of the ordinance to a property precludes the ability of the property owner to pursue a use permitted in the zoning district in which the property is located and results in significant economic injury to the property owner. That is found in favor by a vote of seven in favor, zero opposed. All those who find that the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general circumstances of the neighborhood. That is found in the affirmative by a vote of seven in favor, zero opposed. All those who find that the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the user market value of abutting properties. And in determining whether um, the variance will have an undesirable detrimental effect, the board shall consider if the variance would have the effect of blocking an established view, posing a fire safety hazard, casting a shadow on an adjoining lot, reducing the appraised value of an adjoining property by 10% or more, or eliminating the privacy of an adjoining property owner without an effort to mitigate the lost, prop, lost privacy. But all those who find that that element has been satisfied, and that is found in favor by a vote of seven, in favor of zero opposed. Um, all those who find that the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. That is found in the affirmative by a vote of seven in favor, zero opposed. All those who find that there is no other feasible alternative to a variance available to the petitioner. And that is found 
in the affirmative by a vote of seven in favor, zero opposed. All those who find that the granting of a variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. And that is found in the affirmative, zero, seven in favor, zero opposed. And last, all those who find that the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas as described in Title 38, Section 435. And that is found in the affirmative, seven in favor, zero opposed. And could I now have a motion from someone substantially as follows, uh, whereas four or more voting members of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals has found that the applicants, um, Andrew and Susan Dubuque, have established that a practical difficulty exists with respect to the applicant's property at 586 Preble Street in accordance with the provisions of section 19-5-2B1 of the Cape Elizabeth, of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance, and whereas four or more voting members of the board have found that the applicant has met the applicant's burden of proof, in establishing that all conditions specified in section 19-5-2B1 have been met, um, that we have a motion for the application uh, for a variance of 10 feet from the required 20 feet on the Ottawa side Yes, sir. Um, on the Ottawa Street side for the construction of the proposed addition uh, be approved. So moved. Uh, motion, Ms. Miller, thank you. A second? Second. Second, Mr. Tranfaglia. Discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor? The motion is approved by a vote of seven in favor, zero opposed. And the um, appeal is granted. Thank you. item. I wonder if we could take this out of order. Um, is there anybody here to speak um, in favor of or in opposition to the appeal of Stephen and Lauren LaPlante other than the LaPlantes themselves? Yes? Here to speak in favor of or opposed? Okay. Um, and how about the, uh, the lynch, lynches? People here to speak in favor of or in opposition to other than the parties themselves, the lynches? Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead um, in order as we have this on the agenda and hear the appeal of Stephen and Warren LaPlante. Thank you. Might I take a moment to uh, hand the You may. We have a request for a three minute break. We are in recess for three minutes. <laughs> to hear the next item of business, which is to hear the appeal of Stephen and Lauren LaPlante. 1176 Sawyer Road, tax map U46, lot 10, for a front property line variance of 13.42 feet from the required 40 feet, and a right side property line variance of 11.84 feet from the required 25 feet, to add a second floor to the existing 24 foot by 42 foot dwelling, and 
You all notice that we are missing one member of our board, Mr. LaPlante, because Mr. LaPlante is the applicant. Mr. LaPlante. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to the board for taking the time tonight to hear our request. You all have the packet. And what I have done is gone through and highlighted what I believe are the more pertinent points of the application. I'll go through those closing a quick summary and open up the floor to questions from you about if you so choose. Beginning with the application itself, tab one, uh, it is a non-conforming lot in the RA district and the, um, the percentage of the lot currently covered by structure is 8.59 and if you follow those numbers down through if the project were completed, it would remain at 8.59. Thus, the footprint of the building as it exists would remain the same. We are simply staying within the, um, we are not entering further into the setbacks as they currently exist. Skipping down to A, the need for the variance, uh, it's in part due to the placement of the house during construction. It is not placed on center of the lot. There have been changes in the zoning ordinance from the time of the construction and a factor also working against us in uh, pursuing any other option is the placement of the septic system, which is located directly to the rear of the house. Also, um, a, a few other compelling reasons would be when Sawyer Road was improved towards the late 80s, 10 feet of our road frontage, or our front setback, was taken by eminent domain from the town, uh, by the town of Cape Elizabeth for road improvements. And in addition to that, when Sawyer Road was improved, it was changed to a collector, what is called, what is termed a collector road, thus uh, requiring a 40-foot setback, which impacted us uh, adversely, um, doubly so. Skipping down to what uh, Part C, um, practical difficulty is not the result of the actions taken by the applicant, uh, but it's rather the result of changes in the ordinance. Um, during the home's construction, once again, the taking of 10 feet by eminent domain and the change in the road status to connector road. The practical difficulty by the strict application of the ordinance in regards to 1176 Story Sawyer Road would preclude the LaPlante's from pursuing a use otherwise permitted in this zoning district, as many of the nearest homes are two-story structures. Also, many of the neighboring properties have set side setbacks similar to ours. Uh, the denial of this variance request would cause significant economic injury to the plants for the following reasons. I have listed their health reasons, but I'll speak to that a little bit further on in the presentation and also family reasons. Um, I'll speak to that as well later. But um, the denial of the request would require us to form any other inform of any other prospective buyer that a variance was requested and denied. The home square footage would be capped at its present 1,008 square foot. It makes it a less attractive home to a prospective buyer, especially under the conditions that um, it cannot be significantly increased in its size. Um, and another compelling factor too, it is a small home, 24 by 42, 1,000 square feet. Um, once you back out the part of the square footage of the home, which is dedicated to certain applications, such as a kitchen, a bathroom, uh, closet space and interior walls, there really isn't that great deal of living space to be had within that within that size home. Um, we pursued other well, well, there were no other feasible alternatives to pursue. Although we solicited input from numerous folks, uh, we've spoken to a number of contractors, uh, planners who uh, who came out to the site and looked at it and, and submitted their ideas. We used uh, the code enforcement officer as a resource in. Uh, and, and you know, for suggestions as well, if any were to be made. And the, the most feasible option to pursue is simply putting a second story upon the structure. Um, so that basically covers the application in itself. In tab two, um, Laura and I drafted a letter that hopes to convey both the reason for the need and why we feel that the reasons are compelling for the granting of the request. First off, um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we need more square footage in our uh, common living areas. We've resided in the home for about 11 years and our family has grown. Also, since then, I have uh, developed allergies and suffer from chronic sinusitis. 
I work from home one day of the week and numerous evenings and weekends um, in a home office, which is currently located in the basement. It has been recommended to me, as other recommendations have been made by analogists, that I move that office up onto the first floor where better ventilation exists and a healthier work environment. So I'd like to get that um, home office up onto the first floor. So if we were to add that second story, we can move all the first floor, floor bedrooms up onto the second floor. There is no increase in current bedrooms versus uh, the completion of the project. We would still have three bedrooms. Um, so that's, that's point number one in, in terms of both uh, mine and Lauren's health reasons. She uh, works in the home office as well. And secondly, Lauren's elderly parents moved into a home uh, on 1172 Sawyer Road uh, about four years ago. They downsized from a larger home in Portland. And one of the reasons that they needed to do that is uh, her, her father's health. He suffers from um, pulmonary fibrosis. And I'm not sure if you, if you understand what that is, but he basically has diminishing capacity of his lungs. He's unable to breathe. He's on oxygen. And in the, over the past year or so, he requires consistent or constant um, attendance and a lot of support. Uh, his wife is able to do that, Lauren's mother, but Lauren in her position aids uh, greatly in that. She, uh, she does a lot of <coughs> preparing a meal and maintaining the household, and I myself uh, maintain a lot of the exterior of the home, like the snow blowing and the mowing of lawns and, their, and other, other items like that. So we do need to remain in close proximity. That was one of the conditions that they bought that house, that they were able to be closer to us and have continuing support from us. So moving down that letter to point one, um, reemphasizing again that new construction will not result in a change uh, to the home's current footprint. We will not enter further into our front side or rear setbacks as they currently exist. The current front setback is 26.58 from our property line along Sawyer uh, along the Sawyer Road right away, but the actual distance to our home from Sawyer Road, taken from the curbside, is actually 37.5 feet. So if you're standing at the road looking at the home, it seems to sit further back from the road than that actual 26 feet. Uh, the required setback is 40 feet. Um, once again, Going to point two, it would not be economically feasible to expand our home by placing an addition to the rear of the home for the following reasons. Primarily the current placement of the septic system. Um, to pursue it in that way, of, of, uh, moving the septic system further back to the, to the rear to accommodate the expansion of our home would be very cost prohibitive. We'd be challenged with the additional cost of the replacement of a, of a working septic system in addition to the additional square footage cost of new construction involving foundations. So it's not an economically feasible <coughs> alternative, um, especially when weighed against the fact that we simply want to put a second story on the new existing structure. Um, and one other point, if we were to move our septic system closer to the rear of our, closer to the rear of our lot, to our rear uh, line, we are abutting what the town of Cape Elizabeth uh, has identified as a wetland. So there are some inherent problems with that as well. Uh, after the letter, there is a supporting letter from my doctor, Dr. Dr. Marguerite Noya. She's an allergist, and she goes on to speak that uh, it would be um, highly recommended that the office be moved to the first floor. Beyond that is a copy of a quick claim deed and highlighted in green shows where the town of Cape Elizabeth uh, took by eminent domain 10 feet of our road frontage. Moving into tab three, we have a copy of a survey of our property done by Herbert Gray. And in it, he has found all four pins and identified them. And he has also placed the home on the lot and identified uh, the current setbacks, primarily the ones which are identified here tonight as the, the, uh, the need for the request. And in tab four, what we have is a front picture of 1176 Sawyer Road, our home, taken from Sawyer Road. And the second picture in that tab is a picture of our home taken from the rear. Tab five includes two drawings, and they're also pictured here as well. 
it's a, um, the front elevation, the rear elevation, and the side elevation. The total height of the uh, elevation is 26 feet. Well, within the, the 35 groups. Yeah. And then the second picture identifies what we hope will be our first and second story floor plans. Going into tab six, it starts with a map of the area uh, identifying Sawyer Road. Highlighted in green is uh, our 1176 address and the uh, houses, the adjoint, the houses in the neighborhood that were taken uh, in comparison. Uh, flipping the page over, there is an Excel spreadsheet which shows the comparative houses. What we did to arrive at those homes being listed is in an equal distance traveling north and south from our home on Sawyer Road. And each of the properties listed uh, have a property line on the Sawyer Road right of way. And pointing out exhibit number three, it's the home of Brian and Mary Ann Dennison, 1169 Sawyer Road. Um, bring your attention to that. That was a former single story ranch that was, um, I believe, about four or five years ago, um, converted into a two story structure. And going to exhibit number nine would be the home of Jeff, Jeffrey and Linda Chase of One Silver Drive. Um, and that is also a former single story structure that about 10 or eight years ago was modified to be a two-story structure. <clears throat> and going over to uh, tab seven, uh, I'm sorry, not tab seven, but exhibit number seven, the home of Ron and Jean Gardner. In the lower left-hand corner is our dog, Molly Ann. <laughs> You're the smartest Jack Russell Terry you could ever find. And then going over to tab seven, um, in the form of a petition, showing that we have uh, shown the neighbors our plans and have spoken to them at length about it and they have shown their approval by signing it and uh, listing their, their addresses and the number of years of the residents. So going back, just in summary, our need for this expansion is precipitated by our need for additional living space on our first floor for our own health reasons. Uh, we are tied to this location of our present home uh, because of Lauren's parents and her and I role in the care for them. Uh, they reside in that home nearby. And the described proposal has the least impact to our lot and those of our neighbors. The project calls for a second story place directly on the first. The building's footprint, footprint remains exactly the same and we are not further encroaching our, into our existing setbacks. The proposal is consistent with many neighboring homes and is similar to other projects already completed in the immediate area and there are no other reasonable practical alternative to this project. And the need for the variance request is a result of actions completely beyond our control in a sense that the change to the ordinance since the home's construction and once again the uh, taking of 10 feet by eminent domain and the reclassification of the Sawyer Road to a collector, thus requiring a 40 foot setback. And we have also shown that the immediate neighbors have supported this project. So at this point, um, if there are any questions. Questions from members of the board for Mr. LaPlante. Uh, is, there, is there any public sewer on that one? No, we are on a septic system. And when the road was improved, there was, uh, it's my understanding, there was some uh, discussion as to the ability to put in sewer. And they could not because of the uh, large degree of ledge. Okay. It would have been very cost prohibitive. So that whole area then is all private? private. Yes. Um, yeah, the closest public sewer to that would be the new development in Cross Hill. Cross Hill, yeah. And I believe that was also a major challenge on that project was undertaken. Did um, any people withhold support when you... No, no, everyone that we spoke to, um, and we spoke to them in detail in regards to it, and um, everyone was very supportive of it. Great. Where did you get your setback figures for the... Uh, neighboring properties that are under uh, tab six. Um, any particular ones? Um, no, all of them. One through 13. Uh, they were taken, well, the front setback was determined by measuring from the structure, 
to the structure from a point located 25 feet from the center of Sawyer Road. If you go back to our lot survey, Sawyer Road is a 50 foot right of way. So once again, we discussed it with Bruce, the code enforcement officer, and that seemed to be one of the fairest way to do, to measure the front setbacks. And- So you actually took a tape and measured? Well, what I had was an ultrasonic measuring device. I basically could stand on the road and just measure it electronically. Well, that's what I wanted to know. Yes. Was how you got those figures. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. And it was calibrated against what was a known figure. I basically measured out what was 25 feet and took the measurement electronically and it was determined to be accurate. So then I assumed the other measurements would be accurate as well. Now, was that something that you happened to have in the kitchen? Well, I happened to work for a company that sells them and I was able to use one for the week. But can you download it to a Palm Pilot? No, it's not quite that sophisticated yet. Well, and the reason I asked, I was curious because it's an issue that comes up from time to time when we have these applications and people are reluctant for obvious reasons to walk onto someone else's property with a tape measure. So I wondered how you got them. I can bring one in at one of the later meetings and you can see it. It's, it's actually a really impressive tool. Most building contractors should have one. That's it? Actually not. It's um, probably about $60 or so. Well, maybe our CEO should have one to uh, <laughs> provide to applicants in the future so we can have accurate numbers. Great idea. I'm afraid I'd be coming in with them to show them how to <laughs> operate it. They're great numbers to have, and we don't usually have numbers that accurate, and that was why I asked. Thank you. What did you say the right-of-way width of Sawyer was? 50 feet. 50 feet. Do you know... Uh, your front setback you show is 26.6. Is that, and you also indicate that they relocated. Was the, your front property line re relocated in the 80s? Yes, exactly. So uh, this 26.6 is from the relocated property line to the front of your house, is that correct? It would be from what is, what is the current setbacks, uh, the current pins as they are registered in the registry of deeds. Do you know, what the distance from the edge of pavement to that relocated property line is? Do you? Well, it, it, actually, in my case, it's um, 11, it was, it was almost 11 feet. And I was, when I undertook this application, I assumed that everyone was 10 feet. And it was later pointed out to me that, well, actually, one of the neighbors will speak here later, um, pointed out that he, was, he did not have 10 feet taken, it only was three, three or so feet. So it was later revealed that the town did not take 10 feet from every one of the neighbors. Uh, it was an effort to straighten out the road, and in some cases they needed to take more, in some cases they needed to take less. So that, um, that's how I fell back into, after discussing it with the code enforcement officer again, that the most fair way to present this, and what is probably the most accurate, since not everyone has their pins still showing after 12 years, was to measure from the, cent uh, the center of the road uh, 25 in. But you feel like it's about 11 feet from edge of pavement to property line and then another 26 feet to the, yes. to your dwelling. Yeah, 26 and a half, okay. 26.6. And currently you have three bedrooms and one bath? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And you're going to move two bedrooms upstairs, is that correct? Yes, uh, both our, our bedroom and our daughter's bedroom will be moved upstairs and the, our current master bedroom will be left as a spare bedroom. And you, you'll add two baths up? Yes. Uh, Do you know the age of the septic system? Um, it's, when, I, when we first had the house evaluated, when we were considering buying it, we were told that the septic system as it exists was about six years old. He had had it redone. But he had had only the leach bed done, and we left, he left the steel tank in place, and we have since replaced the steel tank uh, it was a smaller capacity, and we've also gone to a concrete tank, which um, the way the tank works is you have an inlet and an outlet, and the outlet is baffled. Well, that had given out of our steel tank, so we had to have that replaced. 
So the, the, the septic system as it is, um, well, as you know, a septic system, it doesn't come with any gauges or anything that tells you how it's working. You basically are left to determine if it's working, if, if it's flowing slowly, or if there's standing water on the lawn. Well, none of those conditions exist. So, and uh, when we have the tank pumped out every couple of years, um, George Libby has looked at it and feels very confident it's a working system. Other questions? Hearing none, thank you, Mr. LaPlante. Others who wish to speak in favor of the application? If you would tell us your name and address, please. My name is Mary Robin Guthrie, and I live right next door to the plant. At 1174, sorry, 1174. Okay. Ms. Guthrie, go ahead. Okay, thank you for letting me talk. And I've been a neighbor of uh, Stephen and Lawrence for what, 11 years. And they maintain their home beautifully as they do their yard. Their septic system seems to be in terrific shape, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm very much in favor of their doing what they want to do to that home to keep them in the area. I think it'll do nothing but improve our property values. And they have very good taste and maintain the house beautifully. So I'm in favor of allowing them to put a second story on their home. So thanks. Thank you, Ms. Guthrie. Is there anyone else? Your name and address, please. Brian Dennison, 1169 Sawyer Road. I live directly across the street, and I, too, offer my support to Steve and Lauren for putting their second floor addition on. As Steve already mentioned, I did the exact same thing five years ago, and everything will fit into the character of the neighborhood. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mr. Dennison. Anyone else? Your name and address, please. Yes, my name is Martin Barry. I live at 1155 Surrey Road. And, and just a note, uh, I'm in favor of this. Uh, <clears throat> my wife and I moved there uh, in the early 80s. Uh, we were one of the very new young people there. <clears throat> it was basically a small community of mostly retired people who were close to retirement, such as Mr. Dennison's father. <clears throat> and uh, in fact, we bought a house from uh, Bluebeard. He just happened to pass away, but all their kids had grown up, grown up, and and, um, and so there wasn't a need back then of uh, expanding homes. But now we have a new generation coming down, taking advantage of this wonderful school system. Uh, they need a place. They need a good, secure place uh, to uh, to live in this nice town and send their uh, kids to school. And I think this is a wonderful neighborhood to do that in. We're quite happy with the neighborhood ourselves. We haven't had an opportunity yet to, to meet with your people. Uh, uh, we, we, we like the neighborhood, and we're really in favor of uh, their idea. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Berry. Anyone else who wishes to speak in favor of the application? Anyone here who wishes to speak in opposition to the application? Okay, that will close the public comment portion of the hearing. Uh, discussion among board members. The only thing I'd like to comment on is um, the evidence presented by Mr. LaPlante regarding two things, um, medical condition and uh, Mrs. LaPlante's parents. I'm living is it two doors down. Um, although that is interesting information to know, I just want to make it clear that that my analysis of whether the application should be granted isn't really affected by either of those items. Um, it's you know strictly in conjunction with the 
terms of the ordinance itself and the significant economic injury component of the practical difficulty definition um, re defines significant <coughs> economic injury as placing the applicant for a variance at a disadvantage in the neighborhood by applying zoning ordinance standards which would prevent the applicant from having a structure or accessory structure comparable in size, location, and number to those of other lot owners in the immediate neighborhood, but in no case fewer than 10 of the nearest property owners. And the evidence that Mr. LaPlante has presented, and Mrs. LaPlante, um, with the uh, neighboring properties is clearly that what they are proposing is comparable in size and location to um, other properties, other lot owners in the immediate neighborhood. Um, and for that reason alone, the significant economic injury test, you know, is satisfied, uh, which is what the statute, the ordinance rather contemplates. But I just wanted to make that clear, um, in part because Mr. LaPlante is a member of the board, um, and I think it should be clear why um, I'm going to vote in favor of the proposal, and it's for that reason. Other comments? Well, let's go through the elements. Um, all those who find that there is no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance. And that is done in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. All those who find that a literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause a practical difficulty is defined by 30-A, Main Revised Statutes, Annotated Section 4353. 4-C, and that is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. All those who find that the need for a variance is due to the unique, due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general circumstances of the neighborhood. And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. All those who find that the granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the use or market value of abutting properties. Um, and in determining whether a variance would have an undesirable, an unreasonable detrimental effect on the use or market value of abutting properties, the zoning board shall consider if the variance would have the effect of blocking an established view, posing a fire safety hazard, casting a shadow on an adjoining lot, reducing the appraised value of an adjoining property by 10% or more, or of eliminating the privacy of an adjoining property without an effort to mitigate the lost privacy. And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Um, all those who find that the practical, practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Um, all those who find that there is no other feasible alternative to a variance available to the petitioner. And that is found in the affirmative, six in favor, zero opposed. All those who find that the granting of a variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. That is found in the affirmative, six in favor, zero opposed. And alas, the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas as described in Title 38, Section 435. And that is found in the affirmative, six in favor, zero opposed. Uh, based on those findings, um, may I have a motion from uh, someone as follows. Whereas four or more voting members of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals have found that the um, applicants, Stephen and Lauren LaPlante, have, esta have established that a practical difficulty exists with respect to the applicant's property at 1176 Sawyer Road in accordance with the provisions of section 19-5-2B one of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance, and whereas four or more voting members of the board have found that the applicant has met the applicant's burden of proof in establishing that all conditions specified in section 19-52B1 have been met, um, that there be a motion that the application for a variance of 
13.42 feet from the required 40 feet um, as a front property line variance and a right side property variance of 11.84 feet from the required 25 feet to add a second floor to the existing 24 foot, 24 foot by 42 foot dwelling be approved. So moved. Uh, motion, Ms. Miller. Second. Second, uh, Mr. Keneally. Discussion on the motion. Mm -hmm. Hearing none, all those in favor? The motion is approved by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is to hear the request of Michael Boucher representing Christopher and Laura Lynch, 880 Shore Road, tax map U02, lot 51, to repair and replace existing patios and landscape walls within 75 feet of the normal high water line of the Atlantic Ocean. Hi, I'm Christopher Lynch. Uh, my current address is 545. Smith Ridge Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. Uh, my wife and I purchased the house at the end of last year and we'll be taking resident, permanent residence in Cape Elizabeth in July of this year um, after the school year. Uh, I'd just like to introduce the rest of the team. Michael Boucher uh, is the owner of uh, Michael Boucher Landscape Architecture based in Freeport, uh, along with uh, Robert Van Hort, who works for Michael, Will Winkleman, uh, who works for the Witten Architects Group based in Portland, and my son Andrew. Uh, with the other, the other three, four watching on TV. So the, uh, you would have had all of us if we were first on the agenda. The, um, first I want to thank Bruce. Bruce has been out to our house multiple times, uh, working with Wright Ryan on the construction side, the Witten Architecture people, as well as, as Michael Boucher, have been very, very concerned about working in the area inside of the 70-foot setback, 75-foot setback. Um, the house we're talking about is 880 Shore Road. Uh, we, th just a brief history on the house. Uh, the house itself has been unoccupied since 1984 uh, and as a result has suffered significant exterior deterioration. Uh, it was owned by uh, residents who lived there for three or four years in the early 80s, uh, returned every other year or so for a weekend, but really did no maintenance uh, on the retaining walls, on the masonry walls, on the exterior uh, masonry and landscape. And so what we're looking to do is to repair and replace all the existing uh, structure um, as outlined, and I'll go through in greater detail, um, and remove a significant amount, uh, about 2,300 plus square feet of hard surface from the 75 foot setback and replace that with landscaping, grass, shrubs, and so on. The, uh, so we're also putting up for accommodation from the DEP. Uh, which we're looking for as well. So why are, why are we here? Uh, Bruce advised us right away that, that the value of the project we're doing exceeds 50% of the existing value and therefore requires zoning board of approval. Um, and so what we're here to do is to talk about specifically what we're doing and, and if we go to the package, I think the best way to do it is just to go through the, uh, starting with photo number two, is to take a look at the, the property itself. Um, all the walls are basically held together by exterior cement. Uh, the, the, the insides are, are basically hollow. Uh, they need to be reduced and then, and then re-cemented. Um, and that's a perimeter wall which, which goes all the way around uh, the property. Uh, the, there's an interior wall which we intend to remove. And then there's a, a patio or a deck uh, which we intend to uh, replace. Um, and we'll replace it with substantially similar stone, but looking to raise the grade such that it's, as you can see, uh, would, would match the, uh, 
the structure, the existing structure to the left. Uh, we're looking to uh, regrade so that it's a, a level, um, a level lawn in front, and also to on the following page, photo number three, is to remove an interior, again, an interior section of wall. Photo number four is a replacement of an existing seating area along the wall. Again, the, uh, the masonry is in, is in poor condition, as well as another seating area in photo number five, similar situation. The, the largest amount of hardscape that would be removed is a parking area, which is on the south side of the property. Um, and runs almost the full length of the house itself from Shore Road in and is, is hardscape from the front of the house all the way out to the retaining walls. And we'd like to remove a significant amount of that, uh, replace it with just a, a walkway which leads from the, the west end of the house along the front of the house and provides entrance to the front doorway, but again, remove a significant amount of that hardscape and replacing it with uh, grass. If you, if you look at the charts here, they're probably the best way to look at it just to get a sense. What we're looking at overall is about a 40% reduction uh, of hardscape inside the 75-foot setback. The area in red all around is the area where we intend to remove existing hardscape within that setback. The gray areas are the existing hardscape, which we intend to repair or replace depending on uh, which makes the most sense. If it can be repaired, we prefer to repair it. If it needs to be replaced, uh, we replace it in, in its existing location. And the gray area here is currently asphalt um, up to about this point. What we'd like to do is this green area would be the only area that would be an, an incremental add to the, the hardscape where there's currently a little bit of landscaping in here. Um, and removing, as I said, a net removal of all the, all the red areas. Um, and in, in a, I guess in a nutshell, that's, that's really it. Uh, so it's, it's a, sort of the three R's, repair, replacement, and removal of, uh, of a significant amount of masonry, patio, and, and uh, asphalt. I'd be happy to take any, or clarify or take any questions. What are you doing to the grade of the lawn within the setback. I'll turn it over to Michael's done. We've done we've surveyed all the property and done elevations. Uh, the plan of the packet, same as this drawing here with the exception of the color that we added to this display. Uh, the, lawn, the intention with the lawn is just to make this panel of lawn relatively level. It currently slopes uh, approximately two and a half feet, three excuse me, three and a half feet. So we're going to plan to scoop a little bit of this end. This portion of it is rel stays relatively the same grade that it presently is at. And then this end gets uh, filled. It's just about the equivalent of what we're scooping here. Uh, coupled with that, part of the repair of the wall is the walls undulate somewhat with the, with the grade. It's to make them level as well, just make them simpler. And so we're going to make constant grade of lawn and a constant height to the retaining wall uh, just for visual simplicity and for uh, comfort up there. Yeah, also, and also safety. We have four young kids and it's a 35 foot drop from the, the D point, 35 to 40 feet down to the waterfront. Right now, a lot of the wall is about, about this high. We're going to take it up, we're going to take it up a, a little bit higher to protect you know, the younger ones. Are you increasing the height of the wall or lowering the level of the ground? It's a combination of all of them. Part of the wall is lowered, part of uh, it Part of the uh, wall is lowered a bit and part of it will be raised. In the end, uh, no part of the wall will be any higher than any of the existing walls. And no part of the, uh, as I said, with the wall, essentially, we're leveling with In your um, application, where you list the current and proposed setbacks, the current setback is shown as 52 feet. 
and proposed as shown as 53 feet. Is something actually being moved back? Correct. Right. This, this, this uh, structure, this patio here, uh, the current footprint of it in includes this orange and, and, and this here, and this is the closest measurement, the setback you're referring to. This stripe of red here is actually being removed. And so, in this instance, the area of the patio is being reduced by this very slight red triangle here and by this portion here. That's why the setback is increased. <coughs> there appears to be a second stone wall that goes around the outer edge. Here. That's a seawall. That's a seawall down. Uh, Actually, I was thinking this, the middle one. This? No, the, I guess maybe it's not. There, yeah. Right. Is that stone also? Correct. Okay, is that being changed? or? Is That's not being changed in its shape. There are potentially repairs to it. Uh, what we're doing in that instance is this band across here maybe a little more legible here, uh, is going to be a dense uh, swath of shrubbery. And so essentially this whole edge of the uh, wall will be inaccessible from the lawn here or from this lawn, which is adjacent to the main entry of the house. So does that give it somewhat of a terracing effect? Or are, they, are those two walls the same height as you come across. Which two walls? I'm sorry. The, the one that Ms. Miller just pointed out, is that lower than the wall directly above it? Yes, uh, right where your hand is. This, this uh, just, let me just describe it from the bottom up. This, the top of this wall is at an elevation, approximately elevation 20. All along the top of this wall is about elevation, I believe, 40 or so. From here back around, it varies between 39 and 41 or 2. And that's the portion we want to make level, essentially from right here around to there. A good deal of it actually stays the same, and it's just a matter of scribing that line. Um, this will be level, which will be 18 inches below the terrace. Okay, So essentially just creating a sitting edge, with the exception of these stairs. This lawn is also 18 inches below the edge of the walk here for the same purpose of just having a bench height along there. And there's a step as shown here. And in, in lieu of the steps that exist now, this grade from the future parking outside of the setback to the front door uh, is raised a couple of feet. So we're just going to make that all one grade. There's really no terrace to it, aside from stepping down to that lower seawall. And how much fill do you anticipate bringing in, in terms of cubic yardage? I'd have I don't know that, I don't know that um, we've actually calculated that. Um, I'm going to, based on what I know this is, I'm going to guess less than 100 yards. We're moving about, we're removing about 50 yards here throughout this area. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I, would, I could calculate that, but I think it's really interesting. So it's a net increase of about 50 yards or so. Probably. Can you explain to me a little bit of the DEP's involvement and what sure. the concerns of the project were? Because it's in the shoreline zone, we're required to go through a permit by rule. And we filed that application some five weeks, six weeks ago. Uh, and heard nothing back. And the packet, I believe your packets include that process. And so uh, some of their concerns are similar to yours. Um, they're more concerned with first work and any kind of erosion potential, in, particularly in, in directly in the water body. And um, as Chris mentioned, what we're doing within this zone is reducing the impervious surface by 40% and replacing that with <coughs> material and lawn areas which are going to capture and, and force uh, stormwater to infiltrate and 
the ground rather than runoff. Um, so I, I believe in DEP's eyes we're making a, a great improvement in the conditions. And DEP's, I assume, has been out there and has viewed the property. I don't know. With permit by rule, it's file the application, and if they don't contact you, you're approved. No so news is good news. No news is good news. And they haven't contacted you? No, they haven't. When is their expiration for? When is the expiration? The day before we file this application. Oh, so it's passed. And I, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I have several questions, if I may. Regarding the east uh, stone wall, you said you were going to be raising that elevation a bit. Do you know, and straightening, straightening it, it makes a significant jog toward the south end of that. Do you know the, from the highest point now, what your ele your final elevation will be? I mean, how much will it be raised? You, le leveled and raised, what will that raised elevation be different from what it is now? Uh, here is currently 40 and a half, which is being cut down about, I believe, between half and a <laughs> end of a foot. Here, uh, we're going to make it the same. It's currently, and I should say, we don't have a lot of detailed spots along the way. This is, this is approximately the lowest point, and I, um, I think we're probably raising it less than two feet at that most acute dip. But generally speaking, most of the repair, either addition or subtraction from the height of the wall, is probably within the range of a foot. The, the final presentation will be a level wall? Correct. Okay. Uh, in the section you have labeled as B on your proposal, proposed site design, you have a, a line that's labeled 38 and arcs around and into the house. What does that indicate? Is that a constant elevation that you're that trying to achieve? 30, excuse me. A constant elevation you're, you're trying to achieve. That's throughout. correct. It's a 38 foot contour. Along the base of this uh, raised patio, the grade is um, several inches higher, and out at this edge, it's several inches lower. So it will be apparently level, but pitched just enough for natural break. And you're eliminating four steps, five <coughs> steps, and that'll be replaced by a constant grade? That's right here. Yes, that's true. Okay. Uh, the gray area to the north of the garage, is that parking? This is the future, essentially the parking is being moved from here to here in the grand scheme of the project. So that, that is proposed parking area? Correct. And what surface material would that be? Asphalt. And the, the net impervious cover from taking away the orange and adding in the gray, is the net decrease, is that correct? correct. The decrease within the, the, the I, I believe, the discussion of I'm the, talking about within the 250-foot setback, which is where we're looking at the... It's a total the, reduction okay. of impervious surface. Within, within the 250-foot line. Okay. On your DEP application, it refers to 882 Shore. Is that a typographical error? Uh, the 911 redistricting, the house was actually originally needed to So what, what is the new permanent address? 880. 880. And this refers to a the previous address. Previous address. Okay. I assume all the necessary precautions will be taken when the work's being done, so nothing. Absolutely. And that is uh, not only stated here, but a requirement of DEP and a statement in our uh, application. And a, I would say. A, of our End of the town. <laughs> Is there any alteration being made to the foundation in any way? Of the house? Or the this structure has no foundation. Is there any foundation being altered as part of this process? Um, not an existing. I mean, we're, this this well, this, the edge of this patio will have a foundation. The edge of this walkway will have a foundation. 
but there are no foundations in the landscape that we will all know. Okay. How old is the house? It's built in 1928, 29. Beautiful house. Yeah. It looks old. It's very exciting. Within the stoned in area, are there uh, the, the, the stone wall? Mm -hmm. I assume they're current drain points? Correct. It, will those be augmented in any way, or will those remain the same? Where the grade changes, we will adjust them accordingly, but we're not going to change the frequency or location of it. And as it's stated in the application, partly in, in, uh, due to the fact that we're working within a, a limited purpose surface, we're going to discharge water, to sit, have the water leave the site in the same manner that it does today. Say that again, please. Repeat. Yeah. We, uh, the water will be discharged from the site the same way it is now in the end, with the exception of the fact that there is a, an incremental reduction of imperfect surface and the fact that we're actually creating a much better filter for water than exists today with the pavement. Currently, all of this area just drains directly out of a couple of scuppers right off the pavement down to the wall. We haven't calculated that, but it, common sense would tell us that an awful lot of that water is not going to be in the future. So you don't anticipate any any fundamental change of, of underground drainage or pipes or uh, where water will flow out of this reconstructed area any different than where it is today? Uh, not at this time. We don't. I'm talking about toward the ocean primarily. And oh, toward no, your, no. Toward your neighbors. Not at all. Okay. And we realize that. Thank you. Other questions? <clears throat> yeah. Bruce, are there any issues that you have with this? Or any, any no. No, there is. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Mr. Bechet. Is there anyone else here who wishes to speak in favor of or in opposition to this application? That will close the public comment portion of the hearing uh, discussion by members of the board. Um, I'll open by just saying that we appear to be governed by section 19-4-4. B two and three, which is on pages forty one and forty two of the ordinance. And it appears that what we're required to find, and I'm looking at the last paragraph of section three that says in determining whether the building reconstruction or replacement meets the water setback to the greatest practical extent, the Zoning Board of Appeals shall consider in addition to the criteria in section 19-4-4B2, which is relocation, the physical condition and type of foundation, if any. And if we go up to paragraph two right above, the last paragraph of Paragraph 2 says, in determining whether a relocation meets the setback to the greatest practical extent, the Zoning Board of Appeals shall consider the size of the lot, the slope of the land, the potential for soil erosion, the location of other structures on the property and on adjacent properties, the location of the septic system, if any, and here we don't have one, and other on-site soils suitable for septic systems, again, which it wouldn't be applicable, the impact on views and the type and amount of vegetation to be removed to accomplish the relocation. The Zoning Board of Appeals may request guidance from the Conservation Commission prior to its decision. So it seems to me that based on what we've heard, that physical condition of type of foundation is really not an issue at all. Um, and when we look at the various elements up in subparagraph 2, size of the lot, the slope of the land, potential for soil erosion, location of other structures, type and amount of vegetation to be removed, that that encompasses 
the elements for us to consider. Um, slope of the land, they appear to be trying to reduce the slope um, to reduce water flow. Uh, potential for soil erosion, it sounds like they're trying to reduce. Location of other structures on the property don't seem to really enter into this. Um, type and amount of vegetation, vegetation to be removed. Um, doesn't appear that they're removing any vegetation. It sounds like they're adding vegetation and eliminating impervious um, conditions. But I think that's where our analysis goes. I think he just so, so <clears throat> comments. Hearing none. Um, could I have a motion? I think what we want the motion to be here. Yes. A motion to approve the application <coughs> of Michael Boucher on behalf of the property owners Christopher and Laura Lynch at 880 Shore Road, tax map U02, lot 51, to repair and replace existing patios and landscape walls within 75 feet of the normal high water line of the Atlantic Ocean. having determined that the reconstruction or replacement meets the water setback to the greatest practical extent, having considered the criteria in section 19-4-4B2 and 3 of the zoning ordinance. Would anybody like to make a different motion? I'd like to suggest that it be amended to include, uh, by reference, attachment A of the letter from Michael Boucher, which is the project description itself. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, it is. Um, you're referring to Michael Boucher's letter dated March 5, 2002? Yes, yes. Oh, the attachment A to his March 5, exactly. 2002 letter. So that would, that would replace the wording repair. It more fully describes the scope of the work exactly. being completed. Okay. So the request is to amend the motion to replace the portion where the motion referred to simply repairing and replacing existing patio and landscape walls to replace that with the project description identified as, a, as attachment A to Michael Boucher's March 5, 2002 exactly. letter. I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. I agree. Can we Second have that. a motion to that effect? Um, we'll take that as a motion by Mr. Keneally. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> second, Ms. Miller. Discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Opposed? The motion is approved by a vote of seven in favor, zero opposed. Who was the second? Uh, Catherine. And the application is approved.
next item of business is communications any from the town bruce oh sir um i did bring and um left for those members other than dr chapman and mr laplante who attended the um a workshop that was presented by the town council earlier this week uh, the handouts uh, that were given to us um, at that meeting uh, there's some information in there that you might find helpful but no other communications any other business we have a motion for adjournment we'll move. mr keneally second seconded mr laplante all those in favor we are adjourned.